With their massive superstructures and cavernous broad-beamed hulls, the amphibious assault ships look more like cargo or utility craft than powerful warships. Yet they are among the most potent and sophisticated vessels afloat, performing missions that are central to U.S. naval strategy. Tracing their origins from the fiery crucible of the Second World War, they were designed to undertake the vital assignment of putting combat troops ashore on hostile beaches. That basic role survives, but has grown to include dozens of others, from serving as floating hospitals to mounting counter-terrorist operations. They sail in squadrons called amphibious ready groups, or ARGs, which consist of several types of larger ships, like the USS Tarawa, the USS Denver, and the USS Mount Vernon, and a host of smaller landing craft, such as the landing craft utility, the amphibious assault vehicle, and the extraordinary air-cushioned landing craft, the LCAC. Collectively, this family of vessels has been nicknamed the Gator Navy. To achieve success, they depend on a type of teamwork that is unique in naval warfare, a seamless orchestration of naval, ground, and air forces. At the core of this armada are ships like the Tarawa, 778 feet long and displacing over 39,000 tons. The Tarawa is nearly as large as a World War II aircraft carrier. She carries a complement of 30 helicopters, six Harrier ground attack aircraft, and 1,700 battle-ready Marines. From their beginnings as crude adaptations of existing designs, the amphibious assault ships have evolved to become some of the most specialized vessels in naval history. Although these ships are relatively recent additions to the world's navies, the type of warfare they have been designed to wage is as old as combat itself. The time was June 793 AD. The place, the English island of Lindisfarne off the Northumbrian Culloden was about to end. And the instrument of their fate was borne by the sea in the deadly form of the Viking longships employing a technique of attack that would remain a cornerstone of warfare for over a thousand years. These ships plowed straight onto the beach as soldiers leaped from the vessel and swarmed into them, destroying everything in their path. Within a day, most of the monks of Lindisfarne were slaughtered and their treasure carried away in these same ships. Although the term did not yet exist, Lindisfarne was the victim of an amphibious assault, a land attack, launched from the sea. But the beginnings of amphibious warfare go back even further than this. The oldest piece of literature in the Western tradition that we know of is Homer's Iliad, the story of the Trojan War. The Iliad does not have any discussion of a war at sea. It does have, however, an amphibious landing by the Greeks at Troy, so I often argue that amphibious warfare actually predates what we consider war at sea, which would be war from ship to ship. Less legendary, perhaps, but no less significant, were the amphibious operations conducted during a much later conflict, the American Civil War. Working in close cooperation, the Union Navy and Army aimed to cut the Confederacy in two by taking control of the Mississippi River and conquering the main cities along its banks. The campaign called for greater integration of land and sea forces than had ever been attempted, requiring a smooth working relationship between the naval officer commanding the ships and the general in charge of the army. No official doctrine yet existed on how to achieve this collaboration. Fortunately for the Union, however, General Ulysses S. Grant and Admiral David Dixon Porter saw eye to eye. Climaxing with the decisive attack on Vicksburg in 1863, they established and followed a plan which took into consideration the needs of each service. Their unwavering cooperation was instrumental to the success of the Mississippi River campaign. And that really is one of the genesis of Army-Navy cooperation in the U.S. as a team. 
Now, what they, Grant and Porter, had is what we called unity of purpose. They both knew what the objectives were, they worked together well, and that created great success for them. Though the river steamboats had been the instrument of the Union's success on the Mississippi, the specialized ships, tactics, and command structure that would become hallmarks of modern amphibious warfare had yet to be developed. A first step toward achieving a critical element of this equation would be taken just over 50 years later by a military organization that eventually became the most effective amphibious assault force the world had ever seen. That force was the United States Marine Corps. The U.S. Marines can trace their origins to 1775, when a unit was created to provide troops on board naval vessels during the American Revolutionary War. By the time of the First World War in the early 20th century, however, they were fighting regularly as land-borne infantry. But the post-World War I retrenchment and military spending threatened the very existence of the Corps. Arguing that the country didn't need a second land force, the leaders of the U.S. Army advocated folding the Marines into their ranks. The Marines responded as they usually do when threatened. They attacked. Led by their commandant, General John Lejeune, they began to rethink their basic mission. He had the foresight and experience to see that the Marines needed a function separate from the Army, but also that amphibious warfare would be crucial if we ever went to war in the Pacific, where you had islands that had to be contested between the combatants. In 1921, a brilliant young member of Lejeune's staff named Major Earl H. Pete Ellis expanded on Lejeune's idea in a seminal paper called Advanced Base Operations in Micronesia. In it, he predicted that the most likely U.S. enemy would be the Japanese, and that to defeat them, a strategy of major amphibious attacks would be needed. P. Ellis's ideas were primarily conceptual in nature, but in studying the various islands of the Pacific, he was one of the first to realize that coral islands coral atolls would require specialized sort of landing craft. Landing craft that's able to both land on a beach and also pull away from the beach or climb over coral. The leadership of the Marine Corps quickly embraced Ellis's report. Through a series of exercises in the 1920s and 30s, they began developing the specific tactics required to carry out its recommendations. This expanded amphibious role enabled the Marines to differentiate themselves from the Army and was instrumental in the government's decision to let the service survive. It would also have a profound impact on the future conduct of World War II in the Pacific. Unfortunately, Pete Ellis would not live to see his ideas come to fruition. In 1923, under somewhat of a civilian cover, he embarked during a leave period on a personal observation of the Japanese-held islands in Pacific to see whether the doctrine he was writing and the ideas he was writing would make sense. And it was during this period that he died a mysterious death on one of the Japanese-held islands. Some think the Japanese had Ellis killed for spying. But most historians now believe the troubled young officer, who had been hospitalized several times for alcoholism and mental stress, simply drank himself to death. Yet no matter how Pete Ellis died, his ideas lived on. His strategic vision laid the foundation for the doctrine and tactics of modern amphibious operations. But the specialized ships needed to carry them out still did not exist. These would soon emerge in the blistering cauldron of a world war. The date was November 20th, 1943. The place was a tiny island called Basio in the Tarawa Atoll of the Gilbert Islands. Approaching was an armada of over 200 ships, including 10 battleships, 14 cruisers, six fleet carriers, and 12 light and escort carriers. Their job was to protect and deliver 18,600 assault troops and over 6,000 vehicles to the shores of Tarawa and take the island from its deeply entrenched Japanese defenders. Nearly two years earlier, in December 1941, Japan had thrust itself into World War II with a lightning attack on Pearl Harbor. 
Within months, the Japanese military had carved out an empire in the Pacific, protected by a series of heavily fortified island bases. When the Japanese advance was finally stopped by U.S. forces at the battles of Coral Sea and Midway, American military leaders decided to take the offensive. It was determined that we would have to do some type of island hopping campaign. Uh, islands such as Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Iwo Jima, all provided air bases and logistic support bases to push the fleet across the Pacific theater toward Japan. It was almost exactly the campaign predicted by Pete Ellis 20 years earlier. Sailing closely with the familiar troop transports were ships described by strange sets of initials, such as LST and LSD. The L stood for landing and identified the ships as part of the Gator Navy, named after the creature that made its home on both land and water. It was a fleet of highly specialized vessels designed for amphibious assault. One of the L's was the LSD, the landing ship dock. These 4,500-ton ships were 457 feet long, could steam at a top speed of 15 knots, and were armed with one 5-inch cannon and 12 40-millimeter anti-aircraft guns. But what made them unique was the large, floodable well deck in their stern. The well deck was floodable by simply ballasting down the end of the LSD, and then the vehicles could be launched out the back or recovered through the back of the ship in a floating state. As far as the Marines were concerned, this was a significant advantage as far as protecting them from the elements. They didn't have to climb down the nets into a landing craft that's being pitched around by the seas. Rather, they could climb into them within the confines of the ship. The ship could be ballasted down. The craft could be floated out. Also, the craft could be repaired within the confines of the ship. As important as the LSD was, the amphibious assault ship that made the greatest impression in World War II was a vessel that really lived up to the Gator's ability to conquer both land and sea. It was called the LST, or landing ship tank. 300 feet long and displacing 3,700 tons, the awkward looking craft had a large hold and deck area that could accommodate 2,100 tons of cargo. Specialists using a blueprint of the ship and small models would plan the cargo stowing sequence so that the most critically needed combat supplies were unloaded to the beach first. But the most important feature of the LST was how it put its cargo ashore. Using its shallow draft and large bow doors, it could run right up onto the beach, then deploy 163 troops or up to 20 tanks directly into combat. Under normal amphibious operations without LSTs, they would have to load the men, the equipment, several miles off the beach and then transport the men. This was time and labor intensive. By using an LST with its bow open and its ramp dropped down right on the beach, everything could move directly on the beach in a timely manner. More than 1,100 LSTs were eventually built, and modern versions served in the U.S. Navy until the 1990s. But crews of the World War II LSTs joked that the initials stood not for landing ship tank, but large, slow target. It was not entirely in jest. For the vessels were sluggish compared to other warships, making them vulnerable to air attack. But without them, the greatest amphibious campaigns of World War II might not have been possible. The U.S. bombardment of Tarawa commenced one hour after dawn on November 20th, 1943, and lasted two and a half hours. 3,000 tons of shells reduced the island to a moonscape of craters. The Marines and the assault force hoped that the bombardment would silence the Japanese defenses. We were told that with the shelling and the aerial attacks and strikes and the strafing runs, that we would go in and have minimal uh, casualties with a very few vehicles being knocked out because there wouldn't be anything left on that island. Tarawa presented other challenges besides the Japanese defenders. The island was surrounded by wide reefs covered by shallow water. The American commanders believed that the water would be deep enough for their landing craft to float across safely. However, their knowledge of the tidal conditions was limited. To deal with this potential problem, 
the landing force had a new weapon at their disposal, an amphibious assault vehicle that was capable of either swimming or climbing over the reef. It was a remarkable amphibious tractor called the LVT, better known as the Amtrak. Developed by Donald Roebling, the vehicle, originally called the Alligator, was designed to rescue Florida hurricane victims stranded by high water. When the Marines learned of it, they quickly began adapting the craft to meet their needs. To withstand the rigors of combat, the riveted aluminum of the original was replaced with welded steel. The design of the treads also evolved, making them more efficient and dependable in propelling the alligator both in water and on land. And horsepower was increased from 92 to 120 by installing a radial engine originally used in aircraft. Later versions were powered by twin Cadillac V8s. The Marines called it the LVT, for Landing Vehicle Tractor. By the end of the war, over 15,000 of these versatile craft had been built. There weren't nearly that many at Tarawa, however. Production problems and higher priorities for other war material meant that only 125 could be assembled in time for the invasion, just enough to carry the initial waves of Marines. As the Amtraks advanced toward Tarawa, they were able to roll through the shallow waters covering the reef. But then the Japanese, whose defenses were supposed to have been obliterated by the naval bombardment, suddenly sprang to life. I looked out my little slit uh, in the vehicle and saw some water splashes directly in front of me, and then I realized that I was being fired at by the Japanese on shore. And the only thing I could think of to do, I started singing an old cowboy song, quite popular before the war, called I'm a Heading for the Last Roundup. The few Amtraks that were able to reach the shore held on desperately, awaiting the steady flow of reinforcements that were coming in the later waves of the assault. But the men in these units would face challenges of their own. They rode in another relatively new amphibious assault craft, the LCVP, or Landing Craft, Vehicle, and Personnel. This small transport, which could carry up to 30 soldiers, had a bow ramp to allow the easy exit of men or vehicles onto the beach. Developed by Andrew Jackson Higgins, a brilliant boat builder from New Orleans, these ungainly vessels were an incredible advance over the ship's boats that had been the standard landing craft for centuries. But they had their limitations. At Tarawa, the lower-than-expected tides caused the LCBPs to become stuck on the reef. They couldn't get the Higgins boats across the reef. Marines had to wade out and get in amphibious tractors and move across the reef in the teeth of machine gun fire. And it was extremely brutal and very bloody. But the Marines fought on, gun by gun, pillbox by pillbox. At last, after 76 grueling hours of combat, the battle ended in a U.S. victory. 990 American Marines had been killed and 2,391 wounded. Only 17 of the 4,500 Japanese survived to surrender. The lessons learned at uh, Tarawa were uh, multiple, but the foremost one was that we had to have more amphibian tractors assigned to the LVT battalions due to the high loss of Amtraks. More accurate knowledge of the tides and terrain to be provided by small boat-borne reconnaissance teams was also deemed essential, as were better communications between the ships and the landing force. Applying this and the other lessons of Tarawa, the U.S. Navy and their amphibious assault craft swept across the Pacific, taking island after island. Their casualties were high and the fighting desperate. But not a single landing failed. By 1945, the Allies were within striking distance of Japan itself. The accomplishments of the amphibious assault ships were not confined to the Pacific. From the invasions of North Africa and Sicily to the climactic landings at Normandy on D-Day, which was the largest amphibious assault in history, they spearheaded the Allied charge to victory over the Axis powers. By the end of the Second World War, it seemed as if amphibious warfare had been totally perfected. 
But over the succeeding decades, amphibious assault and the amphibious assault ships would be completely transformed by a host of new weapons, technologies, and tactics. With the development of the atomic bomb in the mid-1940s, many strategists felt that massed amphibious assaults had become a thing of the past. The assembled fleets laying right off the beach would be a perfect atomic target. The Marines needed a new approach, a way to launch amphibious assaults from farther offshore, where the ships would be less vulnerable. They found it in a strange-looking flying machine that had made a tentative debut at the end of World War II the helicopter. By the late 1940s, the Marines realized that the helicopter could give them the opportunity to land behind a defended beach and attack from a point of their own choosing. They called the tactic vertical envelopment. It revolutionized amphibious assault and the design of the amphibious assault ships. The first specialized naval ship developed to conduct the vertical envelopment operation was the Iwo Jima class LPH. The Iwo Jima class is basically a mini aircraft carrier that operates helicopters, not conventional aircraft. And basically its mission is to supplement those other ships specialized in bringing landing craft ashore by bringing the troops ashore by a helicopter. Commissioned by the Navy in 1961, the Iwo Jima weighed 18,300 tons, was 592 feet long, and had a speed of 20 knots. Patterned after the escort carriers of the Second World War, it was capable of carrying an entire Marine battalion of 1,500 men and operating up to 25 helicopters. The Marine Corps has always been a combined arms force, and they always recognized that they would need both land, sea, and also now air elements as part of their forces. So the helicopter basically became another element under that umbrella. It uh, has allowed us to have much greater range of territory that is opened up to amphibious operations. With this additional component in the attack force, the Iwo Jima class became an important milestone in modern amphibious assault and a harbinger of even greater advances. A direct descendant of ships like the Iwo Jima is the USS Tarawa. She's an awesome ship. Nearly three football fields in length, rising 200 feet above the waves and displacing some 40,000 tons. The ship has really many missions, many capabilities, almost five or six ships in one. Global events continue to spotlight the need to successfully project power from the sea and USS Tarawa is undisputably the world's most formidable amphibious power projection platform, whose primary mission is to land and support Navy and Marine personnel ashore during hostilities. Commissioned in May of 1976, the Tarawa benefited from over a decade of Navy and Marine experience with the Iwo Jimas. She and her sister ships of the Tarawa class incorporate many advances over their earlier cousins. They didn't have the sophisticated command control communications and intelligence systems that we now have resident aboard USS Tarawa. Uh, not to their fault, frankly, because those systems didn't exist when those ships were constructed. So they were a pocket-sized version in size and not quite so capable because they lacked the amphibious craft, that is, the ability to launch boats from within your own ship ashore. Like the LSDs of World War II, the Tarawa has a cavernous well deck deep within her hull, a floodable area 268 feet long and 78 feet wide, with stern doors that can be opened to the sea. This vast space allows the ship to operate several types of landing craft, including the advanced landing craft air cushion, the LCAC. Additionally, the Tarawa's hangar deck allows her crew to store and repair her complement of helicopters and vertical takeoff and landing attack jets called Harriers in an enclosed space that is protected from the elements. From here, two giant elevators lift the aircraft to the flight deck above. 
Almost as large as the deck of a World War II attack carrier, this space allows the Tarawa to continually launch and recover up to 30 helicopters and a squadron of six Harriers. Vessels like those of the Tarawa class are the flagships of what are called the amphibious ready groups, better known as ARGs. The amphibious ready group is comprised of several ships, quite frankly. The centerpiece, of course, is the big deck, as we say, in this case, USS Tarawa. And we're also complemented by two other classes of ships, the LSD, or landing ship dock, and LPD, landing platform dock. An LPD, like the USS Denver, is nearly 570 feet long displaces about 17,000 tons, and can carry up to 840 Marines. It is also equipped with a small flight deck that can accommodate two helicopters, and a floatable well deck that can launch and recover a combination of landing craft, including the large LCU, or landing craft utility, and up to 28 of the smaller AAVs, the amphibious assault vehicles, which are the modern versions of the World War II Amtraks. A descendant of the World War II LSD, a modern LSD like the USS Mount Vernon is approximately 600 feet in length, displaces nearly 15,000 tons, and can carry up to 560 Marines. Like the Denver, it is also equipped with a small flight deck, but its well deck is optimized to carry up to four LCACs. Combined with vessels like the Tarawa, these and the various other types of craft in the Gator Navy form the most powerful and sophisticated family of amphibious assault ships in history. The amphibious ready group is an important element in the U.S. Navy. We are forward deployed and we view ourselves as the 911 force. That is, if there's a problem, give us a call. We're already on scene and ready to conduct whatever operation the nation desires. We're unique of any service in that characteristic that we are forward deployed every day of the year. Normally an amphibious ready group will sail from its home port and be gone for six months to be relieved on station by the next amphibious ready group. Once on station, the ARG's marine troops and pilots form its primary striking force. I am the CEO of a marine expeditionary unit. I have about 2,200 marines. We are an air ground task force that is put aboard an amphibious ready group. They are the delivery means to get the Marines ashore. The aviation combat element, all of my pilots are Marines. We think that that gives us a special capability because every one of those pilots has gone through six months at the basic school and learned how to be a ground platoon commander. Then he goes off and learns how to be an aviator. So every Marine aviator knows what's going on with the ground component and has an appreciation for the ground component, the ground commander's needs. We feel like that gives us a lot of strength when we go in and, and combine this air ground task force and operate together, Marines supporting Marines in the amphibious assault. Yet no matter how well trained, led, and equipped a combat unit is, war produces casualties. As demonstrated by this training exercise, the Tarawa is well prepared to deal with this critical situation. Her medical facilities are equal to any local hospital in the nation. In fact, we say that when Tarawa pulls into any port in the United States, we instantly become the best hospital in the region. Complete x-ray capabilities, orthopedic capabilities, whirlpool baths, special beds, you know, if you fracture a leg and so forth. Four operating rooms, 300 beds, and 18 intensive care unit beds, which I assure you is far greater than any local hospital. We are our own blood bank, and we carry several thousand units of whole blood on board to ensure that our troops receive the finest medical care. Even with all their extraordinary capabilities, however, ships like the Tarawa and her cousins in the ARG would be utterly helpless in achieving their principal mission of landing troops and heavy equipment without the several types of advanced landing craft they carry. Craft that have been specifically developed to far surpass the capabilities of their World War II predecessors. Among the astonishing variety of landing craft that sail aboard the amphibious assault ships 
are three of the most advanced, rugged, and versatile vehicles ever developed. The landing craft air cushion, the amphibious assault vehicle, and the landing craft utility, or LCU, the workhorse of the group. The landing craft utility uh, most closely parallels those you've probably seen in the World War II pictures, but it's quite different from it. Those were less sophisticated, certainly, and much smaller, and they would transit from the delivery ship, the amphibious ship, to the beach. Today's landing craft utility is, in fact, in itself, an ocean-going vessel. The biggest and heaviest of all the landing craft, the LCU requires the ships of the ARG to ballast their well decks down deeper than for any of its cousins. 135 feet long, it can carry nearly 160 tons of men and equipment. So they pack a big punch, and they're very rugged. They're powered by diesel engines. The bullets uh, have a tough time stopping them. But when they get ashore and disgorge 160 tons of equipment, uh, it's a large footprint, as we say, and, and we're there in force. No less formidable is the amphibious assault vehicle. Unlike the early versions of the World War II Amtrak, the AAV is completely enclosed, affording the 21 troops it carries greater protection from enemy fire. It's powered by turbocharged diesel engines and can reach speeds of seven and a half knots in water and over 35 miles per hour on land. It also possesses enormous firepower. The Offensive armor that we have right now is the 40 millimeter chain gun mounted side by side with a Browning heavy barrel 50 caliber machine gun. At this present date, the only thing that I would not go up against would be a tank. Any other type of target that's up there, I would not hesitate to take out and destroy. Sturdily constructed of lightweight aluminum with an added layer of armor plating, AAVs are built with steel tracks which make the vehicle bottom heavy, giving it a unique ability when hit by an overpowering wave. The vehicle flips over, it will ride itself back over because the track weighs more than mostly everything inside the vehicle. So once it flips upside down, the tracks automatically will swamp it back up. It'll ring everyone's bell inside, but they'll be alive. While landing craft like the LCU and AAV use their engines to push themselves through the water, one remarkable vehicle actually skims over it. This is the landing craft air cushion the LCAC, a type of vehicle called a hovercraft. It actually rides on a cushion of air. It carries about 50 or 60 tons of equipment, and it's a little more fragile in the landing craft utility, but its hallmark is its speed. Normal cruising speed is approximately 35 knots, and it can operate upward of 40, closer to 50 knots. Um, depending upon the environmental factors such as the seas and the winds and the load that we have on deck. The LCAC's outstanding speed means it can reach the shoreline much more quickly than slower landing craft, allowing it to be launched from farther out at sea. We look at that capability as an over-the-horizon capability. Over-the-horizon means that we would be able to start the amphibious assault some number of miles, 100 miles, 25 miles out to sea. In other words, the ships would be over the horizon. The enemy wouldn't know where we were. Despite its emphasis on speed, the LCACs can also carry an astonishing amount of equipment and personnel. Lift capability of the LCAC is up to 75 tons in an overload state, nominal load being up to 60 tons. I have troop capacity within the cabins of up to 23 troops. And then depending upon the vehicle, troops can ride within the vehicles. The LCACs are not limited by the terrain on which to land. Unlike the LCUs, which require a gently sloping beach to ground on, LCACs are able to come ashore on terrain with obstacles up to four feet high. Because it's able to skip across whatever surface, it can hit every beach in the world and just keep right on moving. So that's a great tactical advantage that we now have but what didn't exist, of course, in years prior. Now, by the same token, it has some drawbacks. It's not heavily armored, so you have to go in a place where there is no enemy. The days of going into the teeth of fire, such as Tarawa, are gone. We don't operate that way anymore. 
And that's not the way we plan to do over the horizon operations. That's one of the things that we look at technology to do. And Marines are pretty innovative when it comes to technology. Constructed predominantly out of aluminum alloy, the LCAC is a marvel of modern engineering. Its engines rotate fans, which create a cushion of air underneath the craft's nylon skirt. If you think of the skirt like a donut, it runs around the perimeter of the outer part of the hull. So this way you've got a continuous enclosed skirt, if you will. On the bottom portion of the bag, there are vent ports that vector the air beneath the craft. Combination of the air being entrapped within the skirt, coupled with the mass volume of air underneath the craft is what helps the craft to stay in a hover position. Steering an LCAC requires special skill and training. To direct the craft, a single operator employs three different controls. One for the thrust nozzles located above and behind the pilot house. And two for the independent aft propellers. Operating one in a forward mode and the other one in a reverse mode would help to twist it. Operating them both in a forward mode helps to propel the craft forward, or same thing in reverse. As capable as the LCAC is, it is only one piece of a complex amphibious assault. Operating in concert with destroyers like the USS Benfold and cruisers like the USS Port Royal to provide gunfire support. The ships and landing craft of the ARG can perform a staggering variety of missions. But all these jobs, no matter how different, have one thing in common, teamwork. If we don't work as a team and know each other's capabilities and respect the other's ideas in the development of a course of action, then we minimize our chance for success. It is a type of teamwork that has proven its effectiveness time and time again in operations all over the world. The ships, aircraft, and personnel of the modern amphibious ready group can perform an incredibly broad spectrum of missions. Everything from searches and seizures of contraband on merchant ships, to rescuing down pilots behind enemy lines, to embassy evacuations. We're qualified in about 26 different missions and we practice daily and are able to perform them whenever asked. One of them might be called the Achille Laurel mission, the takedown of a boat or a ship that has hostages on board. And we use Marines and SEALs and a variety of other forces to uh, surreptitiously get on the ship, seize the captors, and free the hostages. These types of operations require practice and split-second timing. Any miscalculation could spell doom for both the SEALs and the innocent victims. As the number of roles for the amphibious assault ships has increased, so have the capabilities of the Marines they carry. Marine Corps is an expeditionary force that can go into a country and operate where there's nothing, no infrastructure. We bring whatever we need to operate. We can set up in a very austere environment. If we're going to go into a place and do a humanitarian operation, we have the capability, self-sustaining, to go in, no impact on the existing society there, do whatever is necessary to support them, and then move back out. They are also trained to operate during local conflicts, such as the civil unrest that swept through Haiti in 1995. But no matter how many missions the amphibious assault ships can perform, their main job is still to land Marines to take an objective ashore. The purpose of the amphibious ready group in an amphibious operation is to seize territory. That territory might be a beachhead, that territory might be a port, or it might be an airfield. Because our mission is to open the avenue for other forces to flow behind us, increasing our influence in the area. The regions of the world where the ARG is designed to operate are called the littorals, those areas that fall within 600 miles of the coastline. The amphibious ready group can prepare to strike any trouble spot in these locations with just a few hours notice. If we get that 911 call that says, take the beach, we would steam toward that area. And while en route, we would develop within about 12 hours the course of action, that is the plan. 
The commanders of the ARG's various units are brought aboard a flagship such as the Tarawa so that the Navy and Marine teams can decide on the best solution to the situation at hand. Hopefully we'll be able to find out where the enemy strongholds are by using our good intelligence systems and be able to, to find his weakness and exploit that weakness. We also use video teleconferencing and we're in contact with embassies around the world and with the Pentagon and the National Command Authority. Once we determine the best course of action in the area, we start to soften the beachhead up. Softening the beachhead means clearing the area where the troops must land of any hostile defenses. To protect them while doing this, the amphibious assault ships often need the assistance of more conventional fighting vessels, not normally a part of the ARC. The amphibious ready group is reliant upon other ships and capabilities that the Navy has. We're one big team out there, if you will. And when we sail into harm's way, we like to have with us an aircraft carrier standing by to provide anti-air protection in the larger battle space. Once the ARG is safe from enemy air power, cruisers and destroyers strike the shoreline with their five-inch guns. Carriers and attack helicopters are launched to provide further firepower and close air support for the troops once they are ashore. Then, troop-carrying choppers are deployed to undertake a vertical envelopment of the area. In all these operations, speed is of the essence. I think speed is critical to the success of any amphibious operation. We succeed by using the landing craft and by using aircraft so that uh, in the orchestration of moving things ashore, in the right quantity and in the right sequence, we have two capabilities to exploit. When the operations commanders determine that the beachhead is clear, the landing craft are then launched from their mother ships. In the amphibious operation, the AAV would be the first piece of equipment ashore. These are heavily armored vehicles carrying combat-loaded Marines with uh, guns on top that would defeat enemy installations and would push forward, ever expanding the beachhead. Following the AAVs are the LCACs and LCUs, bringing in the men, tanks, and heavy equipment necessary to completely secure the area. During this phase of the operation, command shifts from the Navy to the Marines. The commander of the amphibious task force knows that he's in charge of those ships and he's in charge of getting the Marines ashore. And the commander of the landing force, me, knows that once my Marines hit the shore and I start transitioning ashore, there's a very definitive line where I'm in control of the operation. This carefully orchestrated shared command structure among the Navy and Marine officers of the ARG is one of the main reasons the modern amphibious assault ships are so effective in achieving their objectives. With their unparalleled ability to project military power into almost any coastal region of the world, the U.S. Navy's amphibious ready groups form a potent fighting force that has few equals. Frankly, the Amphibious Ready Group is unique in its ability to be the 911 force. We're not limited by territorial restrictions of another country. We are forward, we are free moving, and we're sovereign U.S. territory on the high seas. As regional conflicts and the littorals continue to erupt in the post-Cold War world, the amphibious assault ships with their singular land, sea, and air capabilities will undoubtedly remain an essential element of the U.S. Naval Arsenal.